From his first job flipping burgers at McDonald's and delivering the Washington Post, Craig Willett counts only one and a half years of his adult life working for someone else. Welcome to the Biz Sherpa Podcast with your host, Craig Willett, founder of several multi-million dollar businesses and trusted advisor to other business owners. He's giving back to help business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs achieve fulfillment, enhance their lives, and create enduring wealth. The Biz Sherpa. This is Craig Willett, the Biz Sherpa. Welcome to today's episode. I'm grateful to have with me Matt Waller of Henry and Horn. He's a senior manager at Henry and Horn, and he has a lot of experience with accounting, banking, auditing, and reviewed financial statements. And I'm hoping that today he'll be able to share with you a lot of his expertise to help answer some of your questions about the types of records you should keep and how to be prepared for anything that might come your way. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me, and uh, excited to be on my first podcast here today. Good. Well, we're glad that you chose the Biz Sherpa to be your first podcast. Thanks for joining us. You know, Matt, often business owners, I've seen it several different ways being a CPA myself or former CPA, I don't practice. uh, Often they realize they have a need for a lender and all of a sudden they kind of pick up the phone and call you and say, my bank needs a balance sheet and an income statement. I can kind of show them an income statement, but I don't know what a balance sheet is. How do you recommend, especially businesses that are starting out, what they should do from day one to help them keep track of not only income and expenses, but keep track of their cash and everything else? Yeah, so you know, it's it's pretty amazing sometimes what we see in in practice, and you you descri- described it perfectly. Um, you know, the panic of all of a sudden I need something, I need to figure all of this out, um, and that's definitely not the way we recommend business operate. Um, it's hard sometimes when you're just starting out. You know, new business. You're focused on what you're trying to do. You know, um, it's what you're passionate about. We hope. Uh, you're very focused on on day to day operations, and maybe you're not an expert in finances. So, you know, when we when we come into that, and it depends on the size and scope of what we're dealing with, but sometimes things can be as simple as you know Excel spreadsheets. Generally, don't recommend that um, unless it's a really low transaction business, and that's generally what you might start with. Um, but there's some really basic things that we talk to clients about when you're getting into to starting a business, you know, it may be as simple as open a separate bank account. Um, a I lot think of, the IRS would like that uh, too. So right. They, so they lot, know what you intend is to be business versus personal. Right. So a lot of people just start out their business and it's their personal account and they're running expenses through and then sometimes they're not tracking it. And then at the last minute, they have to sort it all out and you know, it's hard to remember what you did six months ago, let right. alone six weeks ago. So, yeah, and the older I get, the harder that is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so, you know, open a separate bank account. Um, maybe it's just, you know, open a credit card where you track your expenses. There's lots a separate of- separate lo- one where you just right. keep business expenses on there. Right. So if you don't open a separate bank account, at least use a credit card to track those expenses. There's lots of low fee credit cards that, you know, you're not paying a lot, but it just makes the record keeping for that um, a lot easier, you know, and, and just, we're fortunate to live in the era we're in that everything's at your fingertips, right? You right. can do a Google search. Um, it's small business for dummies, you know, it's, it's that <laughs> book, but I think it's really important to to get that basic knowledge and say, some people don't even really know what a balance sheet is, um, you know, what an income statement should look like. So it's some of that real basic knowledge and it's available out there at every, you know, every keystroke, you can find something. What about aids to help you besides an Excel spreadsheet? Are there software packages that are fairly inexpensive for a business owner that may help him, help him or her track their invoicing and and their receipts because sometimes you send a bill out you have to always try to remember if they paid what what's out there yeah the, again we're fortunate to live in the era we're in there are a lot of options at this point and you know I'll, I'll throw a couple out there I'm not a paid spokesman for any of them uh, just just a couple things <laughs> Good, that, no endorsements that, here <laughs> that's right a couple of things that we've we've come across you know I mean I'll throw out to begin with that QuickBooks is still a great platform for a small business. Um, you know, a lot of our clients in that small business range use that that uh, software. 
It's, you know, it, it can account for inventory, payroll, some of the more complicated things that you get into maybe as you scale your business. Um, you know, obviously that's a little more expensive than say there's a platform, um, there's something called um, Zero. That's a it's an online platform. Oh, that, really? That does invoicing, uh, can it can um, connect with your payroll uh, system, you know, and, and it's very affordable. Um, there's even free platforms at this point. Wow. Um, I believe it's called Wave, is a platform that um, it's zero dollars to use. You can do all your invoicing through it. It's a very simple, you know, basic program. Now they get you with fees that they want you to to use their payment platform, and they right. get you on a transactional basis. But it's basically a zero dollar cost system to run a you know basic. You, you balance bring sheet. up a good point. I come from the generation of you know you print out checks, you sign them, you keep copies, you keep them in order. But today is more of a digital transaction environment. I get invoices from people, and they're telling me send payment by. Yep. Any PayPal, number of different, yeah, uh, blue, you know, all these different uh, transactional systems, and they're all linked now, you know, so it's it's very streamlined, and all of these systems have that that capability. And the nice part is, I mean, people want it, generally now you're not even sending paper invoices; it's an invoice through email, yeah. and you pay online through a secure portal. Um, all of these, systems. yeah, whether by credit card or ACH yep. or something like that. Yeah, I mean, my my pool guy sends me my invoice, you know, through QuickBooks. It's a QuickBooks online, and it's through PayPal, and it just feeds right into their system. They never really have to touch anything. It's a professional looking invoice. It's not something you have to print out. All oh, that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. So, um, yeah. It's, so you recommend look into these, use the technology because it makes it easier. One, for you to get paid, right? A platform like that is you don't have to wait for the mail to deliver or not deliver it, right? We all have had problems with the post office. Right. And we don't have to wait for the time lag of payment. Oh, you got to print out a check. They have to be in town. They, instead of, you could be in Hawaii when your pool guy sends you the invoice and you could make the payment from there. It, that is absolutely how it works. I generally get, you know, come out and do something specific and I get the invoice within an hour of somebody being out there. <laughs> wow. and, and probably the the sales or the, the technician has a mobile and probably does the invoice through that and I pay it same day. So, um, so we're yeah, not talking just benefit. about record keeping. We're talking about key elements to, to that are, are the basis for record keeping, but are also key Keys to getting paid timely. Yes. Yeah, and and so it is twofold there. You know, it's feeding all that information into a system that, that you then have to monitor and understand what's going into it, but it does certainly facilitate um, faster payment and, and, and more streamlined. Every business owner wants that, right? It's all about cash flow in the early days because that's less you're going to have to invest in your business if you get paid sooner yeah. I for mean, your work. Cash is king, right? There you go. Well, you know, not only is cash and accounting important, but, you know, a lot of businesses are told, hey, you need to have a business plan and, or a budget. I mean, what, what is a business plan or what is a budget? How does someone even know how to set that up? And then, boy, it seems to me like a pain. I always hate the budget because then I have to see what I didn't live to. I didn't live to my plan. Yeah. Accountability. It's, it's, oh, uh, that's what yeah. it is. That's okay. that, that nasty word, but. That's part of the word accountant too, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. Uh, so those two things go hand in hand, you know, kind of the, the business plan and a budget. I think they, they coexist with each other, but there's, there, there's definitely nuances. So, I, you know, I think a business plan is, is really important for the owner to get an idea of what, that, what your company is. You know, what, what is it that I do? And I, I laugh. I have a, a friend of mine. He's, a, he's an acquaintance, a very good acquaintance of mine, and I see him at a lot of networking events. And he owns a business, and it's technology based. And you know, I'll see him once every couple of months, and we'll talk about business. And I'll ask him, hey, "Remind me again what it is you do." And I swear he has given me a different answer every, every time <laughs> I've met him, and I still don't quite understand what he does for a living. Um, so, it, I, I so think he's constantly changing. He, he's either constantly he's changing chameleon. or he hasn't figured out what it is, how to describe what, what it he is does. he does, oh. what his company does. And because of that, it's hard for him to, I mean, it's hard for me to refer work to him. I'm not quite sure right. what Who, his lane yeah. is. Um, and so that's part of the business plan or budget process is defining you, your market, your niche market, 
what you're really after into a really concise, understandable to not only your customers, but to potential customer. Exactly. I think that's the, the big, one of the biggest pieces to the business plan is it gives you a sense of what am I actually doing and how do I communicate that to, you know, the public, you know, my potential customers. Um, so I think that's a, a really important piece. And then it, it, it kind of leads into, well, this is what I'm doing. Now I need to understand how I make, how can I make money doing this? <laughs> right. And that's kind of this budget concept. You know, how do you know how to price what you're doing if you don't really know what your costs are, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's getting that understanding of what does this business look like, you know, from a, from a dollars and cents standpoint. Right, you need to understand what your overhead is, what your other costs are, not just what your product costs and how to make a margin on that, but to cover all your other expenses. Right, right. And, and to set set goals. You know, where do you want this business to be in one year, in five years? And, you know, it's okay to, to miss budget. Um, right. You know, these may be aspirational. We, we tell our clients set realistic budgets, but, um, and you can spend a lot of time talking about the effectiveness or, or ineffectiveness of those, but. Um, right. But I think the aspiration is important. People yeah. need to aspire to something, but you have to bring a sense of realism to it too. Not so right. much that the, no one's going to test you on whether you made your goal. So you don't want to set your goal too low that you're not pushing yourself to be successful. That's right. It's it's that that fine art of finding that middle ground of nothing too astronomical that I know I'm never going to hit this. So why even try? And um, Or too low that you're just not right. trying. But if you're enough. only accounting to yourself, that's one thing. But if you have investors or a bank loan, you need to be fairly realistic because if you don't meet, meet your targets and have or have a good reason why you didn't, they're going to start to... Uh, it will start to undermine your credibility with your investors or your lender. Yeah, will makes it not? Them, makes them nervous. I yeah. mean, they they expect that you understand the market that you're in, um, and they're going to want to know what those plans are. You know, particularly investors. You know, bankers maybe have a little more retrospective look at at, at your company and look at other things, but an investor is there generally to seek an exit plan and they want to see growth and understand how you're going to do it. Um, so. So that budgeting process is really critical, um, particularly if you're looking at um, outside investors. I think that's great. You know, so now you have your budget, you have your business plan in place, you've got your software so you can bill and, and collect. Um, what's wrong with the theory of, hey, I don't have to really look at my bank statement. The only time I have to worry about my bank account is when I overdraft. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of things wrong with it. Okay. Uh, well, we, we mentioned that cash is king. So, right. so you know, yeah, as long as I have money in the bank, what does it matter? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, probably the biggest thing, um, to be honest, is that, that's where you, that's where fraud occurs, right? I mean, if you're not an inventory heavy company, what's the only other asset that um, is susceptible to fraud? And, you know, fraud is prevalent in, in our, society anymore. Yeah. You know, I, I, especially third parties that could access unbeknownst to you, to your accounts. There, there is all sorts of manners of, of fraud now. And if you're not keeping an eye on your cash, um, then you're not doing yourself any favors. And it's not a matter of understanding every penny and dollar that goes out. So reconciling to the penny shouldn't be my objective. It should be more, I'm safeguarding. It, generally. And, and it depends on the size of the business you're talking about, right? If you're talking about you know, it's a it's a five man operation. Um, you know, you're in there every day. You kind of know what's going on. If you've grown your business to fifty people to seventy five people, um, you start losing the ability to see that on a day to day basis. And it's important for you to just kind of keep that second set of eyes. I mean, it, things can happen. You reminded me of an, an experience I had early on in my career as a CPA with the second firm that I worked for. Um, they had a client, it was an automotive repair shop and the client was great at repairing automobiles. And so were his sons. And so were the other employees of the business. And they had a bookkeeper an accountant working in the business and the bookkeeper at the end of the day, it, they started wondering why do we keep growing and we keep getting more and more revenue, but we still don't have any extra cash or we should have had greater profits at the end of the year. They hired our firm to look into it, and what was happening? We let we. I told them to put their uh, their bookkeeper on vacation for a week, so we could just come in and look. And what he had been doing is there was no cash ever getting deposited into the bank. 
So the cash receipts at the end of the day, when he would go take them, he would make up the deposit slip and everything was credit card receipts or checks. And the rest of the cash never made it to the bank and he was pocketing it. We estimated, based on the invoices we sampled, over $200,000 a year in cash that never made it there. When they called him to talk to him about it, he ended up not showing up to the meeting, rather committed suicide. Now, I'm sure it was embarrassing to him. And I think they would have worked something out with him knowing this was a family-owned business and he was like family, wasn't related. But it just goes to show you, if you're trusting other people to do functions in your business, reviewing once in a while what happened, you know, for them, they could have stopped it a long time ago by looking at, hey, we had this many invoices the other day, we had this much in sales, and here were the receipts from it, but only this much made it to the bank. What happened? And it got to be really bold when he, when he started realizing no one would know. He took all the cash. Yeah. And we, we see this cash happening. Cash meaning the, the, the dollar bills. Right. That's what, and it's, it's good for, our, for business owners to understand that just because it goes out in the bank doesn't mean it always hits the income statement. Where a lot of fraud gets hidden is on, on a balance sheet. And maybe an owner really doesn't, you know, they're not focusing on a balance sheet or they're not, you know, they understand revenues and expenses. But if you have an accountant in place internally, you know, there's, there's an ability to hide funds for some time on a balance sheet that you might not even notice. And if you're looking at the bank statement, you get a sense of where your cash is going. So, um, and and it kind of leads to the point of why you might have a, a third party CPA come in and do, do financial statements because you want that third set of, set of eyes um, because trust is, you know, it goes only so far. Right. Anymore. And you don't want to tempt somebody. The problem is why give them the temptation? Right. Right. It's like somebody sitting in front of me, I'm on a diet and they're sitting in front of me a dozen donuts you know, I know I'm going to eat at least half of them Yeah, right yeah. then. Yeah. I'm, I don't have the self-control. Don't put the dozen donuts in front of me because I love yeah. cream-filled donuts and I'm going to eat them. Yeah. But, you know. And, and the same thing. I like cash. I needed a little bit. Maybe his intent was I was just going to borrow a little bit, needed something, and I'll pay it back. And then no one ever asks. So then he takes more and more and you get more and more confidence to do something to where it escalates to where most people that commit that kind of fraud don't realize how big it got. Right. Right. And- this has been a major talking point in my last six months to really? my clients, given what is going on in our world, you know, with the pandemic, everything going remote. That means controls in, within internally are breaking down. People are economically hurting. Your employees might have taken pay cuts. These all create what they call the classic fraud triangle. And I think you're going to see a lot of fraud, unfortunately, occur or come out within the next six to 12 months in businesses because we've created a, a, an environment that is ripe for, you know, has all those conditions present. Um, so I've been telling clients, keep an eye on what you're doing. It's really important right now um, to follow that. What role can an outside CPA firm be in helping that? I mean, there's audits, there's reviewed financial statements, but are those designed to detect fraud or what, is there something in addition to that that a business owner might want to consider? Yeah, so it, it's kind of a classic misunderstanding a little bit of, you know, I have an audit done, so that's for sure going to detect any fraud that's occurring in my business. And unfortunately, that's that's not the case. And that's not what an audit is designed to do is make sure that every penny has been accounted for. Um, so why do we pay accountants to do reviewed financial statements and audits? And usually but, significant fees. What, right. What's no, it designed to do then? It, it is. So it's designed to identify significant fraud. So that's kind of the the, the understanding is we're not going to find out that somebody's taken $100 from your business. Or, <laughs> and and de depending on the size of the company, if you're a $100 million company, we might not detect you know, $100,000. It's all, it's all relative, right. but it's giving you a, a relative sense of safety. So, you know, the classic is it's no material misstatements on the financial statement. Right. So, so, so we're they're providing- They're following segregation of duties. They're following certain procedures yeah. that should prevent significant activities that are would misstate the financial statements. Yeah. All of, all of those controls are in place. And if they aren't, we can let you know and, and give you recommendations of this is a bad, you know, bad method or bad practice. Here's what we would suggest in terms of, you know, segregating duties or setting up different processes. So I kind of derailed you. I, I want to yeah, come back sure. to, I want to come back to reviewed financial statements yeah. and audits, but I yeah. think let's talk for a second about how can you help a small business owner that wonders if 
there's somebody doing something with their cash or credit cards or online payments or something like that that is diverting it. Yeah. So, so usually the conversation starts with what, what keeps you up at night, you know, and you listed some of the common areas that are susceptible to fraud. And if they have those concerns, we certainly can come in and design specific procedures to look at those kind of things. Maybe starting with how does this just, how do these get processed? Who's involved in it? Let's, let's talk to them, you know, put a little heat on them, so to speak. Right. It's always uh, nice when someone's looking over the shoulder. It's kind of the unfortunate the guy that committed suicide, once he knew somebody was looking over his shoulder and he, he didn't need someone to tell him he was doing wrong. He knew what he was doing. Exactly. And that kind of looking over kind of either prevents or discourages. Yeah. And then kind of to the idea of the audit, it, a lot of people think that it's going to catch all the fraud. So it does prevent fraud uh, from occurring. But um, yeah, it, we, we ask business owners if there's specific concerns and um, we we're accustomed to that. We have a lot of different um, procedures, things that we do to to be able to go in, test those, and see if we think there's anything unusual about that and bring it to their attention. So if someone's concerned, they ought to do that. Now, back to reviewed financial statements and audited financial statements. Often, um, when is a good time for a small, a small startup business to consider using those types of um, outside services in the, in a business? Yeah, there, there's a lot of considerations to it, but but generally it, it's when the owner is unable to really keep an eye on all functions of his business. So it's it's an it's an element of size. Um, generally, that might be related to number of employees. Um, it can be related to revenues. Uh, so, it, but but in general, it's when the owner. So when it comes from an owner requirement, it's when you can't sleep at night. You know, you have a little bit of concern that you want that done. You know, the other big reason is you expect that you're going to need financing to continue to grow your business. Or I'm looking to add investors to this business. Right. And by and large, those types of relationships are going to want to see at least reviewed financial statements. Right. So a lot of lenders will put that as a requirement that we want to see reviewed financial statements on a periodic basis annually. And then certainly investors at the sophisticated level, if the dollar amounts are getting up there, they'll insist on audited financial statements, whether you're a public company or not, right? Uh, 100%. I would say if it's considered private equity, um, an audit is all that they they will generally accept. Really? Um, so yeah, you you might have the the friends and family round. That's fine. You know, they're not going to push those kind of things on you. Or if it's kind of a personal relationship and you have that and that that going on. But once you get into the outside investor world, um, by and large, a lot of them will will insist on on an audit. Right. Um, so if you don't like that level of sophistication, I mean, you grow to a certain point. Certain people want only a certain amount, they have a number in mind of what they're trying to do and they don't want to necessarily grow any b- bigger or they don't want to take on the responsibility or the accountability to investors. And so they can, you can control whether you do that or not. Yeah. But at some point, once you make the decision to do it, the decision's made for you that you have to do the audit or the review. Yeah. I mean, if you're in the fortunate position that you never have to seek, uh, you know, lender financing or investor financing, kudos to you and congratulations. That's a <laughs> heck of a business. Um, but a lot of them, you know, need that in order right. to scale and grow their business. And and the bank, you know, they want, they want that. They need that. They're de-risking their investment in you, you know, essentially. Well, and then they're regulated. So they have to have documents in the file saying that they've looked at and considered and, and understand what's going on in in their loan portfolio. So they need to understand the business and the annual performance update of financial statements is a big one. It, it, it is. Shows, it shows whether things are getting better or worse. And if it's getting worse, what the company's doing about it. Yeah. And it's funny. I often refer to what we do as, as being the insurance policy over your financial results. You know, if we're if we don't do a good job when we're doing an audit or a review, those investors or bankers can come after us and, oh. and recoup their funds. We're like an insurance policy to them. We're saying these are good. And if they aren't, you know, they, they're going to look at us and and. Uh, seek recoupment of those funds. So we're really so like an in insurance the policy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So it gives them assurance. And that's really what it's about. It's an assurance function. Yes, yeah. Great. Now, let's, we were talking about lenders in relation to financial statements. 
As a CPA, are there times where you find that you're able to refer your clients to banks? And tell us maybe some experiences because matching the right lender to the right or, or the right customer or client to the right lender is important. How do you know how to do that? What what businesses are suited to community banks? Which ones are suited to regional banks and which ones are suited to national banks? Yeah, so this is a conversation we have almost immediately when we get involved with with clients of ours. We want to know, you know, who your lending relationship is, who your attorneys are, who your insurance providers are, all of these things. Because as CPAs, we get to know, you know, it's kind of your professional services group, right? Um, we all talk to each other. We all network and we all refer work back and forth. So we have a good idea of who the good players are and who the, you know, not so marginal. good players are. <laughs> yes, marginal. Um, so usually, you know, as a small business, you start out, you probably continue to bank your business with whomever you banked with personally. And that's generally, you know, the the Wells Fargo's, the Chase's of the world. Um, but but a lot of times those aren't the best fit for a small business. They're, to be honest, those large banks aren't focused on that that area. And that's even why though they have it, even though they have small business lending arms, they they have that function. But I'd say that a lot of that's very automated. You know, that's how they make money: automation, and that's when you call a hotline and you get routed to five different people and never right. get an answer. But as right? a business owner, you want some relationship, some understanding that if there's something you need, a special need coming up, you need someone to talk through. What's the best way to help me with this? Right. And that's, you know, and we don't necessarily promote that it needs to be a local bank um, or a regional bank, but often those can have a little more personal touch at that smaller business level. As you grow your business, those large national banks certainly make a lot of sense, you know, and, and they're very interested in you and they do very well by you. So, it, it we, you know, it's all it, it's it's very common for us to get into a relationship um, with a client. We We meet them. We ask them who they bank with. They say, you know, Joe Schmo Bank. Um, we ask them, what what's that relationship like? Are you happy? Uh, and again, that that may unleash the flood of, <laughs> you know, I've been well, trying to get a story. Yeah, yeah, I've been trying to get a loan with them. They won't bank. You know, they won't provide much more than you know five hundred thousand dollar line of credit. They're not comfortable with it. And we can say, hey, here's a list of a couple banks I'm familiar with. They do exactly what you guys, you know, or they're very familiar with what you do. Um, encourage you to talk to them and we can even provide the the healthy lead into it. And that even makes the bankers more a little more comfortable. Yeah. I think they like that. I've seen it often in my experience that there's a, a, a company that's banking with a certain bank and because they'd been there so long, the bank would make them a loan, but it wasn't enough. And the bank wasn't educated and wasn't specialized in that type of industry. And they weren't able to support them the way two or three other banks I could think of yep. could. What is that like? Can you tell us a story of maybe where you're able to match a better situation? You can name names if you want, but you know if you don't feel comfortable, I, I understand because we don't want to trash it, any particular lenders. Yeah, so we run. I I do a lot of work with contractors. Okay, so contractors can make banks construction uneasy. Contractors. Yes, construction um, can make banks uneasy. So, um, <laughs> oh, really? Why is that? <laughs> yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> we we won't mention what happened twelve years ago or so. Um, <laughs> Financial crisis, right? So we'll get into a relationship. You know, I have a, I have several clients that are we're banking with um, a, a bank here locally that clearly had become uncomfortable with with banking contractors and and the way in which they squeeze their clients is is upon renewal there's always additional fees that are added on there's you know right. increased covenant requirements that make it really hard for you to run the, your business the way that you want um, right all of a sudden now you have to have a certain amount of cash to debt liquidity and, yes yeah. and debt to equity coverage and and all the things that that make it harder for maybe you to continue to grow your business you know the bank doesn't that bank doesn't want you to grow your business, you know. Right. They want their if, loan paid off. They want it, you to go somewhere else, it, but they don't want to tell you to go somewhere else. Right. So, so we come across that in industry like that, and and instantly we can tell you. I know, you know, two or three banks that love working with contractors. They have a lot of them. They understand that business. They know what to look for in terms of of how to lend to them. Um, that make it a lot easier. So, um, don't think that your bank does it all. 
Um, and that would be similar to an, an accounting firm. You know, not every accounting firm does construction contractors, right. and they may not be familiar with it. And right. that should and make so they'll you do feel you a disservice if, when they issue a financial statement. It may not appeal to the bank because it's not following the conventions they're used to seeing. Yeah, uh, we have picked up. I've picked up financial statements that clearly the accountant has one or two contractors. They don't have them on percentage of completion. They don't have whip schedules, all the things that a traditional bank would expect to see from someone fluent in that. Right. Um, so it's beneficial to line up in your industry, both as an accountant and a bank. And sometimes that changes. Banks em- de-emphasize certain industries and don't want to make new loans there. So sometimes you have to move around. I had a, a, a key strategic advisor tell me a long time ago, and I'm grateful that he did, he said, Craig, you have all of your loans with one bank. And they did. That bank would lend me anything I ever wanted. I mean, I kind of had an open checkbook with them. And I'm grateful that we had that kind of relationship and trust. And I and I honored that relationship and always repaid. Um, and I appreciated their trust. But he said, you know, what happens if they get in trouble for some reason and they can't make the next loan? You need to have a relationship. And so I went to two other lenders and built relationships there, which helped me to some degree. And so you're right. You Sometimes you need to consider not just one bank, but maybe you have two or three. Yeah. I mean, the big banks- For different reasons. But, yeah. I mean, we see a lot of the the transactional day-to-day um, needs of a business, meaning, you know, your checking, your um, you know, receipts, that kind of stuff, may still reside with some of the big national banks. They have, you know, platforms built to really- make that very efficient for them, but they may not be your best lender of choice for the business you are. So that's when you may look to, you know, a regional bank or a a local bank um, and gives you some of that diversity. So that's great. Now, you know, as a CPA, there's other services that you can help provide such as maybe, are there times where you sit down with your clients and say, you know, if, as we look at this, you seem to be light on your profit margins from what we know without disclosing what your other clients do but why might that be? And you can help them try to identify areas that may help them improve their financial performance. Yeah. I Does that happen occasionally? It, it happens. It happens a lot. And it's the most gratifying aspect of, of what I do. You know, people, okay, so I just don't bring you a pile of stuff and say, hey, get me a financial statement so I can get my loan renewed and I'll see you next year when I have to file my tax return. That's what, you know, we do as accountants live in a very compliance driven world and we do that function and, and we do it well, obviously. Um, but I think the best way we can serve clients is getting into the conversations you just mentioned. And, and we do have that. The, the nice part about us as um, public accountants, um, you know, I work with 50 and have worked, you know, 50 clients at any one t- point in time and have worked with hundreds of clients, you know, over the course of a career. So you see a lot and you really gain an understanding of what works for clients and what doesn't. And being able to sit down with the owners of those businesses or the, you know, CEO, CEO, um, and say, hey, this doesn't look right. You know, what are you guys doing here to address your profit margins or have, you know, y- your employment numbers don't look right given what you're doing? You know, let's talk through that. Um, that gives that opportunity to be that that actual advisor that's much more meaningful uh, to them and it's much more meaningful to us. It's it's where our value resides. Right. It's not in, you know, preparing taxes and, and audits and, you know, there's a lot of firms that do that, so... I think that's important. And I think that's key to our audience to have them consider when I'm hiring somebody, what can I get additional? What's the value add here? Now, that mean may mean that they pay you additional hourly rate or a different contract to undergo that. But what, what a great benefit to a business to have somebody who has financial expertise that they can't hire full time. Right. You know, if they had to hire someone of your level, they'd be three, Two, three, four hundred thousand a year. There's no way they could afford to do that, but they can pay you so much an hour for a period of time to help identify those areas and come up with a strategic plan to address them. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I'll go back to you know Henry and Horn. We have you know seventy five plus uh, construction contractors. You know that I work with. You know that provides a lot of perspective as to how those businesses operate, and and that's valuable information to you know an up and coming startup or whoever it might be. And um, so I think that's that's pretty important. That's great, and I think that's something that people should ask because I know it's often intended, but so often you said. 
accountants tend to be compliance oriented. They're deadline oriented. Got to get this into the bank by this date or get this report to the IRS by this date. And so there, somebody's always pressing for a deadline. But it's important, I think, to look at people who are going to say, all right, this is right, we've done that, but now let's sit down and find some other time to talk. I know some of the best advice my father-in-law gave me when I was starting my own CPA firm. He said, and he had moonlighted doing this when he worked for the IRS doing tax returns for people. He said, Craig, do me a favor. If you're going to start your own practice, take an afternoon a week. This was every week. Take an afternoon, leave your office, and go out and visit your clients. And I went and did that. And, you know, without fail, I always came back with more work because they started, they had all these questions. They said, Craig, we're having to deal with this, or we have this. We, we don't know how to do this, or we're not sure what to think. This is what's going on in our business. Can you help us? And I came away with more work every time, and I'm grateful for the advice. And so on the flip side, if you're looking for an accountant, look for one who's going to take that kind of interest in you to help you. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you the number of clients that have basically become friends of mine. I mean, you, you know, there's certain professional lines that you don't cross, but um, I, would, I would certainly count a lot of my clients as also friends because it's... You know, they tell you all the secrets, you know, eventually they tell you all the secrets. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you have the inner, you have the inside scoop too. You can see it. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. You've, you've already looked under it. the hood. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you, you know, they, you know, and you can tell them that their, uh, their kid is ugly sometimes and that's our job. <laughs> you know, that is our job. In, in a very nice way. That's sure. right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hey, I have a, another question about cash flow. I'm just wondering how, if I'm a new business owner and, you know, we talked about having bank cash in the bank, that's fine as long as they don't overdraft. And I think some people run that way. And I know there's a period of time in my life where I have, because you're busy enough focused on what's important. And if you hire someone and you look at it periodically, you can avoid the, the fraud or the other situations. But what are some keys to understanding what cash flow is? Um, just some basics that our viewers and, and audience can understand about cash flow. So, so I'll start with a kind of a, a quote anecdote, not sure what it is, but if you really want to understand the importance of cash flow, talk to a business that has had problems with cash flow, right? It's that makes sense. Ask them, ask them how difficult it is to call your customers and beg them to pay you early. Um, take calls in from that vendors your and, and beg them to pay them later and, and see how that makes you feel as a business owner. So, so that's kind of the cautionary tale of if you don't think cash flow is important, think about how hard it would be to do those kinds of things and how that might impact your business. So um, as you from mentioned- From a credibility standpoint to begin with, and also yeah. just a personal, just it's embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's, in, it's, it's humiliating for these these professionals and, and may, they may have been very successful and still are perhaps very successful but but to have those conversations is is humbling humiliating uh, you know any number of things and hard to sleep at night so um, certainly cash flow is is one of the most important metrics and and the real basic thing to look at um, and this would be done in in even your lowest level of financial statements you know compilation it's a it's a cash flow statement and it's really understanding where your cash is coming from. And we always look at the metric of cash from operations. So let's disregard, you know, funds you're getting from the bank. You might think you have a lot of cash, but it's because you owe the bank, you know, a million dollars. Right. Um, so, so you don't really want to look at that in terms of how your business is operating. You really want to focus on what is my cash from operations. Yeah, I've got a line of credit for a million, so I've got a balance of 900000 in yeah. my account. But I'm doing great, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but eventually uh, we, we all got to pay the back. piper. Yeah, yeah so it, it's, it's getting that basic, um, you know, report. And, and this is something that's available in a QuickBooks or some of these other uh, softwares that you can click the button and get, you know, a, a cash flow summary. Right. Um, sometimes it, it requires a little massaging and it may not be perfect, but it gives you an idea of um, what am I really generating from my day-to-day -day operations? Is it really that I'm just I have cash because I've collected on old receivables, right? But I don't have any new sales. So, right. uh, so I'm going to run into a problem here in the next 60 days. Um, so it's 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 looking at, at that level of scrutiny of where, where am I generating my cash? Is it just that I'm delaying payments to my vendors? And that's why I have money in the bank right now. So there's a lot of, of underlying... Um, components to to cash flow, and that's why I think it's important to to get that understand. It's it's a basic statement that every business owner should really 
kind of get an understanding of. Um, and, and if they don't seek some help to do to do that, because you can kind of see trends that will help you 60, 90 days from now so that if you have a impending cash flow crunch, you can go increase your line of credit at the bank if you if you're prepared and explain to them why. Here's yep. here's what I'm faced with and here's how I'll pay you back. Here's when it will correct. Yeah. I mean, getting in front of that is is vital for that very yeah. reason. Well, and banks can't react as quickly as they used to too because of regulation. They can't just, you can't walk in one day and go, hey, I, I've got to meet payroll tomorrow. Can you get me the loan? Yeah. It's, that's Unless not, it's the PPP that's loan. Not, <laughs> <laughs> those, those, those are quick. Yeah. We'll see if we get more of those, but uh, and that again, it, it lends to that credibility. Your bank's going to get uncomfortable if you're coming to them every six months of, "Hey, I, you know, I need this or I need that," and it just shows you're not as business savvy as you probably should be. Great. One other question that I have in the back of my mind, I I, I often think about, and that's loan programs that are designed for small business to help those that are are new. Well, not necessarily new, but younger businesses or smaller businesses at the SBA loan program. What, what experience do you have with that? And how do you feel about that as a CPA? You know, it's, it's a mixed bag. I think um, the, the SBA loan program uh, can be beneficial if you really have a good business idea, I would say. Um, they can come with a lot of strings attached. And oftentimes, uh, they have there's a lot of hidden fees within obtaining an SBA loan. So it, it sounds great, you so, know. Yeah, hey, I'm gonna get a six percent loan, but but there's fees out the nose, you know, perhaps in terms of all the the things that you have to and- provide. You're personally you're likely personally guaranteeing these loans. So if and pledging the collateral, uh, you know, your, your house, house your, equity, your car, yeah. your you know, everything that's involved in it. Um so it and there's reasons for that, but you have to understand that you're doing that when you sign. You can't yep. you can't just say, "Hey, this is a great loan," right? Without and understanding. Yeah, what, I what think a lot of people, are. for some reason, think it's an SBA loan. It's meant to you know kickstart any business that you know, idea that I have. And if it goes belly up, well, it's it's kind of this government loan, and they'll you know it's they'll find a way to it'll yeah. get buried in the trillions of dollars that you know that are <laughs> that are up there. But they'll um, be knocking on your door the day you don't pay it back. They will. So. Um, like I said, I think if you have a solid business idea, business plan, a good management um, team, you know, these can make sense. And it's, it's a good way to get funding for your business. If you can't tap, you know, you don't have a friends and family bucket or, you know, that you hadn't personally saved that amount of money, it's viable, but it's, it's a cautionary, you know, there's lots of cautionary tales out there. um, So I take it that you, you Apply it when it's necessary, but you think that banks in general, by their very nature, if they're serving their community well, they on their own should be able to find a way on their own balance sheet to take these non-government guaranteed ways to help lend to the businesses in the community. Yeah, I think the SBA program is your your last resort. Um, okay. Would, would be my that's take on it. That's interesting because there are some people that feel the other way, and yeah. I think that's a great view, but you have a lot of confidence. And I think that speaks to hiring the right team to help you approach that. If you're going to go approach one, a bank, before you go just straight to the SBA, make sure you talk to some accountants that might be able to open doors for you. And based on your credibility and based on some past operational history of the business, there might be a better solution that's less costly and, and less rigorous. Yeah, it goes back to, you know, do you have a business plan? Do you have a budget? Do you have financial statements? You know, yeah. all these real basic things. If you can go in there and walk in there confidently and and feel comfortable talking about that, the bank's much more likely to provide you traditional lending than having to go through the the whole SBA program. That's great. That's good to know. And I think sometimes people need to, I think our listeners need to understand what's available out there. And I, I appreciate your perspective. Now, you can never enter the Sherpa's Cave without answering one question. What is your greatest failure? And then what did you learn from it? Well, this is a tough one. You know, I, I, there's been lots of, fa- I, I fail on a weekly basis, maybe <laughs> daily sometimes. So you ask my wife. I'm oh, sure she, 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 true she, confession time. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it was funny, you know, I, I, I was kind of a, aware of the question. So I, I reflected back because he you know, said greatest failure. I said, man, I have to think about that one. But, um, you know, it, Mine was a a true failure, um, and it's probably something I don't even know that my my parents know this actual fact about Uh-oh. me. But uh, are I, they going to be listening? I, they, I'm <laughs> sure they'll end up listening to this podcast. Okay. Um, I actually failed out of um, engineering school when I was in college. In my, I was through almost my 
uh, through sophomore year and a really bright kid, but I, I, I failed. I mean, and, and that was, I mean, that was huge, obviously. I mean, I, I come from a background of a very educated family. You know, my dad's an engineer, my brother's an engineer. So it's the family tradition you had to uphold. A little bit. And that was, you know, when you mentioned, you know, kind of what do you, what do you learn from, from these failures? Um, that, that, that was one of the things on the surface of, you know, don't let other people's expectations shape how you, um, you know, shape your behavior or what you want to do in this world. And it's not that they provided any overt pressure. I mean, I love, no. I love my folks, you know, and my family. They were no, always very, well adjusted they, despite <laughs> your failure. <laughs> they, they're, 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 they were always very supportive. Um, but I just realized that this isn't, you know, you just, I guess innately, I just stopped being interested in what I was learning there, you know, which is, which is like, you get through a certain point, but then it's like, I just don't enjoy what I'm doing here and just a lack of, of effort. I mean, to be honest, it was. So how did, how did a budding engineer turn to be an accountant? Well, so, so that, that was one of the defining, defining things. It was sitting back and saying, well, you know, I, I enjoyed a certain, ad. I got into engineering and why did I initially go there? I always loved math. I, you know, since high school, I was just uh, math. Just for whatever reason, it just sounds stupid. It got me excited. Uh, you know, That's I enjoyed great, it because I hate math, but I'm really good at it, and and I don't really like it. <laughs> I, I just liked how you know you could always find a balance. You know, there it, something equals something else. You know, and oh, you can okay. kind of come to an answer. And so I enjoyed that aspect of engineering, but then there were other aspects that I just didn't really enjoy. That you know, it's funny. The science, although it involves involves a lot of math, just it just got weird to me. Mm-hmm. I just didn't, didn't enjoy doing it. Um, so hence the lack of effort in it. Of I, I don't know what I'm doing here, but that that love of numbers and kind of where, where does that lead me, right? And um, you know that that was kind of a, another takeaway of of learning about this process of. You know, it's okay to tell people that you don't know what you're doing. Right. Um, you know, it's kind of saying I, and literally throwing up your hands and say, I, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. You know, that, <laughs> so that was pretty heavy at the time. So um, who turned you to accounting or it, how did you discover it? It, it, it was no specific. Um, I, I can't pinpoint a single person in this endeavor. I would tell you that I talked to a lot of people about it, you know, and it was, it was friends, obviously not my family because so <laughs> right, this no. is the, the family secret that I'm unveiling, but um, you've heard it here on the Biz Sherpa. <laughs> that's right. But in talking to friends, it, it was it was kind of vetting that conversation of, well, you know, well, what do you want to do? Uh, and it's like, I, I kind of like the numbered aspect, numbers aspects, but you know, what do I? Some of them were business oriented, you know, business majors, and they said, man, you should just, you know, accounting, finance, really sounds like something you might Try. enjoy. Yeah. And when I got into it, I was lucky to have one professor, um, John Dalmas, and he's still actually. Uh, a lecturer, you know, I don't know what his official title is at ASU, um, but John was the best accounting teacher I've ever had, and somehow he made accounting very, very interesting. He wove real life examples uh, of how businesses use accounting, and and it really just kind of, you know, the light bulb came on and said, "Man, this this is a little more interesting than I even thought on the outside." It's it's just as nerdy as engineering, right? But um, <laughs> for some reason, this just really um, hit home. And and I do have him um, to thank for some of that. And and some of the other professors there at ASU, and obviously I'm promoting my Sun well, Devils. No, this but, is great. Yeah, the Sun um, Devils. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> you know, this resonates with me. I remember studying, my, my aspirations were to go to law school. So I was studying political science and economics as a, economics as a minor. And I got into economics and that got in over my head. And I remember I got in one course, everything else was good, but I got a D minus in one course. I don't know why I didn't get it just a flat out F, but the teacher must have felt compassion for me because I at least took all the tests and I failed them miserably, but he gave me a D minus. And I started thinking, you know, do I really want to go to law school? I wasn't sure. And, And that created some uncertainty. And I talked to somebody about it and they said, you know, account uh, or lawyers who understand accounting do really well. So you had to take an accounting class and I hadn't given up on going to law school yet. And so I took an accounting course and it's the first time in college that I never had to do my homework. I could just go to class the next day. I understood everything. It all started clicking. It came naturally to me. And I, although I was sitting there going, what am I going to do with this career? I really want to do something else. 
but it kind of clicked. And so I think what we, what, what I take from this is, right, we have our plan for ourselves. And I like what you said, don't let somebody else define yourself. I almost didn't do accounting because my older brother was doing it and I didn't want to do what he was doing. So <laughs> yeah. I almost let that <laughs> keep me from doing it. But I did, and we and he and I took different paths at some point. Both have master's degree in taxation, and both, you know, I, he he still practices accounting. I do other things, and you know, it's interesting how we don't have to feel like we have to set out on one path. Just like your friend who, when when you ask him every time you see him at a social yeah. event, he can't say what he's doing. Yeah. Maybe he's still evolving, but sometimes in business we start out with a certain idea. And maybe that doesn't quite work out, but we have to be able to pivot and be able to take that original premise and maybe focus on something bigger, better, and a better opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think and it looks like you did because it seems like you fit this well. Because if you're out there helping your clients do, introduce them to banks, help them understand their performance compared to others and help them enhance their success, what a great asset you are to your clients. I, I would like to hope so. And I will say I went into accounting and I got straight A's in every class after that. So, wow. so just to let you know. Uh, okay, it, so you're not it, a dropout. That, that's right. I don't want anyone <laughs> to think. Redeeming yourself for your clients <laughs> who are going to watch this No, this podcast. is mom and dad. No, oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. no. no uh, they didn't get your report cards? I know no. now you can't. You have to get permission to see your children's yes, report Yes, I'm sure I, I, I explained it away. But uh, <laughs> no, it's very successful after that. But it's finding what you love to do, right? And, right. and uh, pursuing that avenue. and. Um, I was lucky to have found that and find myself in this career 20 years later and really enjoying it. And I think that's the secret to success, being able to love the clients and be able to give them extraordinary service, give them value beyond the dollars that they're paying, not only for the compliance that you provide, but provide additional insight, provide introductions that can help them move their business forward. And I think that's what makes any business a success and any business owner a success. So I'm glad that you were willing to be a guest on our show today, Matt. I appreciate the time you took to be here. Thank you, Craig. I really appreciate it and enjoyed it as well. Well, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Biz Sherpa. I'm sure you'll enjoy Matt Waller and we'll have the contact information for Henry and Horn on the screen if you want to call them. It's a great firm. One of my sons works there too, by the way, (laughs) my son, Michael. Anyway, this is Craig Willett, the Biz Sherpa. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to go to our website to access the resources related to this episode at www.bizsherpa.co. If you enjoyed this show, tell your friends about us and be sure to rate our podcast. Craig would like to hear from you, so share your thoughts in the Facebook community at bizsherpa.co. Follow us on Twitter at bizsherpa underscore co and on Instagram at bizsherpa.co.